We love Las Vegas food and for years have been covering the exciting developments in the city's diverse dining scene. The culinary offerings in Las Vegas span cuisines, styles, and budgets, with restaurants from some of the most recognizable culinary figures in popular culture, including Wolfgang Puck, Bobby Flay, Giada De Laurentiis, and Guy Fieri. We recently took a break from our usual programming to highlight an exciting and diverse lineup of Las Vegas chefs and restaurants. We've chatted with the biggest names as well as some rising stars who will be appearing on the marquee for years to come. Check out these really cool episodes in the This Is Taste podcast feed. And so the way this works is every hour we load a tote or totes full of uh, the beautifully prepped items uh, and then load that onto a wagon. It's pulled by a bicycle and six minutes later, uh, we're loading that prepped food into the production system. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Today on the show, I welcome in Steve Ells. Now, Steve is the founder of Chipotle, 4,000, 5,000 restaurants in America, a real visionary when it comes to QSR. Well, he has a new restaurant called Colonel, and I've had the pleasure of dining at it. And we talk all about Colonel. We also talk about some new menu items and how he has a robotic arm in the restaurant. It's not as creepy as you think. It's actually really cool. We also go back to the days of Chipotle founding this iconic restaurant group in 1993. Some of his big menu hits, some of his misses, and really how he was able to grow that brand and how that brand has inspired many restaurants today. I'm looking at you, Sweetgreen. I'm looking at you, McDonald's. It's so cool having Steve Ells in the studio, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Steve Ells, welcome. This is Taste. What a pleasure to have you into the studio. Matt, thank you for having me. This is great. We were just talking off mic. I think I've been to like four of your restaurants that you've been involved with. So. There, there, there are 3,000, over 3,000 Chipotle's, <laughs> and you've only been to four. I've, <laughs> I've, I've been to four concepts, I'll uh-huh, say. I I've see. been to four. We'll, get, we'll go over all of them in, the, in this interview, and, and really lots, of, lots to cover. But first, I like to ask a lot of guests, what is good in New York restaurant-wise? You live here. You're eating out often. You have your restaurant, which we'll get to, Colonel. But what's good restaurant-wise for you? So, um, I mean, I have a lot of friends in the business, and so it's it's hard to name, you know, just just one. And I just uh, I don't want to go through the laundry list, but <laughs> but um, I, I will say that uh, Ron Yan's Chinese restaurant called Tolo, mm-hmm. uh, Lower East Side, is fantastic. And he was he was the chef at Parcel and yeah. uh, worked with Grant Reynolds. Uh, and Grant's, of course, you know, a wine expert. And so Tolo not only has fantastic Chinese food. But an amazing wine, wine list. list to go with it, and so and so we sat outside, and that was an that was an amazing experience uh, a couple weeks ago. I love that. I'll definitely mark that. Down. I've not made a Tolo yet, so it's fun. It's just such a great New York scene. You're sitting out, you know, in yeah. the action in Lower East Side, and uh, what a great place to have a meal in the summertime. It's super fun downtown. Let's go back to your time. You worked at Stars, and I I feel like maybe some of our listeners know you best as the founder of Chipotle as a restaurateur, as a, as a big ideas guy, but you also went to culinary school and you worked at Stars with Jeremiah Tower, important chef. What's your time like at Stars in San Francisco? S- Stars was great. So I, I did two stints at Stars. So um, after college and before Stars, um, I went to the Culinary Institute of America and halfway through that program, uh, it's a two-year program, Halfway through the program, you do what's called an externship, and you you choose a restaurant uh, to go gain some experience. And uh, you 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 leave the school for about four months, and you work in this restaurant. And so, and I chose Stars. And um, it's a funny story because you know, this is 1989, and uh, I I I find the number for the kitchen at Stars, and so I I call up and. I says Jeremiah there, <laughs> just going like going for it. I love it. And Not even said, chef. You just someone said, said someone said who's you know who, who's this? I <laughs> said oh it's Steve Ells. I'm at the Culinary Institute of America, and uh, uh, he said, hold on. And uh, a few minutes later, 
uh, Jeremiah gets on the phone and asks, who is this? I said, oh, it's Steve Ellis. I'm at the Culinary Institute of America. I'm a student and I'd like to do my externship at, at STARS. He goes, oh, we don't do that program. I said, no, 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 no. I, you know, I've been a, I've been a customer. I'm a huge fan. Um, I, I've really got to do this. Um, uh, listen, if you don't, if, if, if you don't like me, just, just tell me to walk and, and I'm out of there. Mm. Just give me a shot. He goes, okay, fine. When are you going to start? When, when do you need to come? And I, and I gave him a date. I think it was the beginning of July. And, uh, so a couple months goes by and, and I, and I get ready. I, I come with my knife kit all, all ready for my first day at stars. And I show up, I said, Hey, I'm Steve Ellis. I'm here uh, to, to start. Um, I just uh, talked to Jeremiah a couple months ago and, uh, they're like, who, who are you? Who was <laughs> <laughs> No idea. <laughs> Jeremiah right? wasn't there. No one no. had any idea. So they, they put me in the basement on prep. Yeah, and I and I uh, made tomato concasse out of about ten cases of tomatoes. First and day, that was my first day. But you, but you, you knew production. But I loved, I loved yeah. every moment of it, and I spent the four four months there, and then they invited me back after I graduated. So that was the. And then you end up working garmanger in those roles. I worked all the stations. Yeah, through my you know uh, almost three years there. When you're working at at Stars, and you're you're also a student at the CIA, is there are there some ideas that are popping around your brain that would end up make informing how you you founded Chipotle in 1993 so the the idea of um sort of local seasonal artisanal uh very very important yeah. you know the provenance of the food uh was was paramount at, at stars back in the in the starting in the mid 80s uh, it wasn't typical to um to have listed uh where the lettuces came from or you know where the beef was from, and so this was a this was a really new idea, and uh, and I loved it, and uh, I had the opportunity to visit farms and understand uh, more deeply about the importance of ingredients, and I think ultimately that's one of the things that that really helped uh, make Chipotle a special brand, uh, that we brought uh, very high quality ingredients to the world of fast food where before it was always about the cheapest ingredients. Yeah. And you, you did it for real, like at true scale. It wasn't like this idea that you're going to bring high quality, like you literally achieved it, which I think is the biggest testament to that brand. It was great. And, and what I'm so proud of now is that there are so many fast casual uh, concepts who, who have followed in Chipotle's footsteps who are, who are doing the same thing who are bringing really great ingredients now so that, that everybody gets to eat better. We'll get to some of those later. I want to know in 1993, you're opening on the campus of University of Denver nearby, um, and you're opening your first shop. What's that first year of 1993 like for you? What are some of the big hits and misses that you that you offered on your menu? And like, did you, at that moment, 93, believe that this was going to be a big thing? That it was going to be a big thing did not cross my mind. I'm, I didn't. I wasn't even convinced it was going to be a small thing. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> it was, sure. It was scary. Um, the menu as you see it today is largely this, it was largely the same. Um, I, at one point experimented with, um, little, um, pastries, little empanadas. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I remember, uh, using the barbacoa, uh, as a filling for those, uh, that lasted maybe a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but too much I, labor involved in making but, them every day. Yeah. The oven wasn't appropriate for, yeah, for baking. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, but, but what you see today is, is basically the, the menu and I, and I hit it, you know, luckily, uh, from day one. So you hit it. I mean, let me ask you about getting to the point where you knew you could open a second location. Is that like a, is that like a week one thing? Like in terms of demand for this idea of an assembly line, the idea of customization, that things that you really innovated that we see today at Chipotle and many other restaurants? Well, so it's interesting because. Today at Kernel, we're asking a lot of our customers. It's so different. It's, 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 the restaurant is different in almost every way. And so we're asking a lot. But it reminds me of 31 years ago, I was asking a lot of my customers at Chipotle. Uh, let me give you an example. So uh, a customer would walk in and they would walk up to the cash register because that's what you do at a fast food restaurant. Well, we in 1993, yeah, we'd have yeah. to point to say, no, no, you start over where the tortilla presses are, and so okay, and they'd walk over there, and 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 we'd say, well, what would you like? And they'd say a chicken burrito. Okay, well, would you like black or pinto beans? People say, well, what does it come with? 
uh, comes with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they would ask for, about the difference. And the same thing with the salsa or cheese or sour cream and so many questions. And, and, it, and it was a lot of friction for customers, a lot. And um, uh, folks were giving me advice and they said, Steve, you know, you need to put up signs, order here, pick up here, verbiage that would explain the different choices and, and how the process worked. And, and I didn't want that clutter. I, I knew that would be clutter. And, and I knew that eventually people would figure it out. Um, I, I'm glad that I, that I stuck with it because c imagine seeing all that clutter in all of the fast casual restaurants today. And I promise you, nobody walks up to the, to the cash registers today in a, in a fast, in a fast casual restaurant. Everybody knows the drill, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so, and, and, and I, and I remind myself of that as we're continuing to show new customers, something completely different at Kernel. We're going to build towards Kernel. Uh, you're, you have one location now, but there's expansion plans and there's a lot of innovation there. We're going to get to it. But first, I want to ask you about Pizzeria Lucali, which I went to in Boulder. I love that place. Why did it not quite take off the way it maybe you wanted it to or maybe I'm just wrong? Well, so it's interesting. So I, I did a couple of other brands. I did Pizza Pizzeria Locale and uh, Shop House. Yeah. So Big fan of Shop House as well. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. So Pizza Rio Locale, um, sort of a Neapolitan style pizza that we we, we sort of evolved that to a to a more um, a more cooked and firmer uh, a crust uh, over time, and and pizza and um, Shop House, a Southeast Asian uh, quick serve concept, both were really really good. And and if you looked at the uh, the success of those concepts uh, in a vacuum, and uh, looked at you know the loyal following and the quality of the food and, and overall the economics, I would say that they were very good indeed. Um, but when you compare them to the engine that Chipotle had become, uh, they were lagging. And so why invest in something that doesn't do as well as the mother? You're a victim right? of your own success, Steve, it, it really, sounds it like. It really was. And, and, and so, and, and, I, and I started these as a hedge because I thought, well, how many Chipotles could we actually build? And and uh, as it turns out, you know, the team now is predicting, I think, 7,000 or something domestically. So, and I don't doubt that for a moment, but we didn't need other concepts to, to grow Chipotle as it turned out. Uh, and, and we learned some, some things uh, and it was, a, it was a nice experience, but we sold them off and, and they're in other people's hands. Now. Yeah. And, and like, obviously, Pizzeria Locale has been done many times over. You were very early, but you get Blaze and other brands that do that quick fire pizza. But Southeast Asian at, at, at Shop House, I want to ask you, like, that, those flavors we talk on the show all the time. We're like, why aren't they bigger? Why aren't they done at scale? Do you believe that a Southeast Asian concept can be as big as Chipotle? Well, I don't know. Uh, one one of the reasons for Chipotle's broad appeal is because you can make um, combinations from all of the ingredients. Yeah. There aren't there aren't combinations that you could make at Chipotle which would be bad or off putting, and and that wasn't true for Shop House. Shop House, there were some some very distinctive curries and and. Um, uh, tamarind vinaigrettes and things like you necessarily you wouldn't necessarily mix all of those things together like you can mix and match at Chipotle. So I think I think just foundationally Chipotle uh, is is uh, a sort of a very um, broadly appealing uh, uh, flavors and textures mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, different types of, of yeah, components. less prescriptive, frankly, it seems, yeah. and that's why a lot of fast casual and fast food QSR works uh, really well, and certain flavors don't. Well said, thank you for sharing that. Let's move on to Kernel. I really have a bunch of questions about your new plant forward concept. Um, there's robotic arms there. There's incredible plant based chicken. I love that dish. Great cookies. You got Andrew Black there cooking. But first off, Steve. Why do this? You, 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 you don't need to open restaurants. You don't need to do this just on the surface from my point of view, but I could be wrong. Why open Kernel? Well, so uh, need to, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's a need for Kernel. Um, if I look at, you know, sort of the struggles of operating uh, fast food restaurants and fast casual restaurants today, it, it's mainly around labor. Um, the, the turnover rates are astronomical. And in the three decades 
uh, the last three decades that I spent uh, running a large chain, you know, it only got worse, and I predict it's going to continue to get tougher. Um, and I think I think the reason you see such high turnover, uh, and, and these reasons fall into two buckets. One is pay, and the other is the work itself. So, the, unfortunately, the economic model of these places does not allow for higher pay. I think most operators, uh, owners of restaurants, would pay more if their economic model allowed. It just it just doesn't. It's a low margin business, business inherently. It's, margins are are tight, right? Yeah, yeah very yeah. tight, and we all know that. But the other but the other problem is just the work itself. I think people today are are less interested in, you know, flipping burgers and, and making fries or all the other equivalents. Taking out the trash, different. doing the recycling, doing the you end know, of day. So people, people have other options. And to, to me, there's no question that uh, a lot of this work can be automated and, and uh, someone's going to figure it out. Someone's going to crack the code. And so, so I think we have a, a, a really cool system at Kernel that does a, a few things. It allows us to make better food than the fast casual model or the fast food model for sure, but it allows us to make better food than the fast casual model. It allows us to um, lower turnover dramatically because we can pay a lot more uh, and we've reinvented the work and we will continue to evolve the work. So it's something that will become desirable. Um, and it's also a system that's uh, highly replicable. It's very easy to, to roll these out, uh, much easier than the traditional fast casual or fast food equivalents. Lots of follow-up questions. Thanks for taking me through it. And I think the big part I take away is, is the labor, uh, the idea of automation. I think you have a robotic arm in the restaurant, which has gotten some press. I don't want to dwell on that per se. I think there's a lot of other cool innovations happening with automation. But tell me, you know, I love the fries. Like, first off, like those fries are incredible. Like, like tr truly the food quality is high. But how do you see this working at scale? Because I think that's all ultimately what you want to do. Because right now I'm, I'm seeing great food at one location. How do you replicate that? Yeah, Matt. So so the um, the, the, the basic model is is on a foundation of a, of a hub and spoke. Hub and spoke, great. So, so we have a hub, which is our prep. And if you think about the importance of prep, well, so in in uh, 93, when I opened Chipotle, fast food did not have, and it still doesn't, but fast food didn't have uh, knives and cutting boards and pots and pans. And yeah. So there was no real cooking there. They had scissors, right? <laughs> Pretty much scissors in plastic bags. So, right? so Chipotle, Chipotle really uh, forged the way for real cooking. And now all the fast casual uh, uh, models have uh, has, has fo have followed, and and people are eating better because of that. But but the fast casual model has a limit in that in that the 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 prep space, the amount of people it takes to do the prep, and the amount of training required, especially given the um, the extraordinarily high turnover, uh, stresses the system. And you can only have uh, a certain uh, level of prep at, at, at these at, at, at these places now. And so, but at Kernel, we have a chef and his small team doing prep all day long in a, in a space built for prep with uh, beautiful equipment, and we can do a lot of production. And, and we can leverage that over multiple restaurants. So our first uh, central kitchen is uh, downtown on 14th Street uh, between 5th and 6th, and so it can easily handle uh, all the downtown restaurants. Our first restaurant at 24th and Park is a mere six-minute bicycle ride. And so the way this works is every hour we load a tote or totes full of uh, the beautifully prepped items uh, and then load that onto a wagon. It's pulled by a bicycle and six minutes later, uh, we're loading that prepped food into the production system. Mm -hmm. So Matt, when you place an order on, on your app, uh, the uh, robot arm engages and puts things into the oven, and and the and the system, the automation, some of its robotics, the automation uh, uh, handles all of the disparate pieces that make for an order and times it perfectly, so that things are done on time consistently. And and I spend most lunches uh, at at the restaurant 
talking with customers and talking about what they're eating and 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 and, and looking at the food. And the the consistency of our composed vegetable side dishes or our sandwiches or our salads is mind blowing. They all look identical. And you know the typical fast food picture or fast casual picture of of food. It doesn't look like the thing that you unwrap. Well, at Kernel it does. It's yeah. really and it's you got really the, it's kind of blowing me and away. And those hourly runs from the from the commissary is helping achieve this model, right? And That's it's right. And, and you're able to cut down on your your labor in store. There isn't even a, a register. You're you're buying it on your app, which is not, you know, common. You find that anywhere, McDonald's to sweet green. But then you're not really interacting with anybody. You're literally picking it up out of a cubby. Well, this is this is where I got it wrong. I I thought we could have three people back in the production area mm-hmm. and no people up front, and that customers would just know how to use the app and they would know how to uh, open the cubbies and they wouldn't want to interact with people. And, that's a and, that's a big assumption there. Well, and I got it wrong. Uh, I think eventually there will be more customers than not that will use restaurants like that. Yeah. But but today I think this this notion of hospitality with a human is is important. Yeah. And so uh, I'm there a lot. We have uh, greeters who are there every day. I see. And we're engaging customers. I like to see that. My feedback initially was that maybe it could be a little more like friendly. I guess have a little more and, vibe. And, and 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 now it is. I think that's great. <laughs> and so I, we've learned our lesson. Now here's here's what will happen over time though. Um, as new technology comes out, um, we'll be able to move people from the back of the production cell more uh, uh, customer facing, so that the uh, the kernel uh, employee of the future uh, will be you know engaged in hospitality, and and maybe from from the front of the house will be uh, reading a dashboard, understanding the uh, you know how the system is is functioning. Again, it's it's really reinventing the McJob. Again, gone are the days when people want to flip burgers and and make fries, yeah. and instead. Uh, we need to empower them with the ability to be um, engaging with customers and and um, operating um, sophisticated technology in a way that allows them to um, to oversee the entire operation. And I'm going to assume that you're going to be paying over minimum wage. So we're starting people now at at twenty seven dollars an hour and uh, with full medical, dental, vision from day one. Paid vacation from day one. Yeah. And, um, and uh, our uh, chief people person just started uh, last week. She's great. And uh, we're actively working on a, uh, an equity program for hourly folks. And, and, you know, in the industry, you hear, ah, you can't give hourly folks equity. It's too complicated. Uh, they don't value it. And, 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 I'm, and, I, and I don't believe that. I, I think you have to design something that resonates with folks that they can they can um, monitor and understand and see how it appreciates. Do you offer equity at day one? Is that a big well, part of it? Well, we don't we don't offer that yet. We don't yeah. have the program designed, right. and so we're in the process of doing that. But I I feel strongly yeah. that people should have a piece of the action. You know, one of the principles uh, that the platform is based on is is lean manufacturing, and so part of lean manufacturing is feedback from the folks who are actually in the production system whether it be an assembly line or what have you. It's, it's often, uh, we often refer to lots of the, um, like Toyota, for instance, is, is a, uh, a user of the lean uh, system. And so there's feedback from the folks who are actually working on the line to help make the system better. And so we're actively engaging our folks in a huddle at the end of every shift to make sure that the system is optimized in any Anything that they can recognize uh, that can help make the overall system better, we're, we're, uh, we're employing that into the into the overall. I see this. Platform. I see this working out really well. I, I see theoretically this working out really well. You only have one location. I think that we've certainly changed our, our habits of just the way we consume and we order. You know, from our app, we we pick up at Starbucks, Sweet Green, McDonald's. We don't. There's like it's become less friction. There's been less friction in the way that we we are ordering on the front end, the way we're picking it up. So us as consumers, we've been programmed to have less friction, just to like go in and leave. So I can imagine um, in the back of the house, it's going to be the same. This idea that you don't need to show up and flip burgers. It's going to be coming from a commissary. There's going to be few people working there, and it's going to run itself through efficiencies that you're going to pick up at the end of the day with the huddle. Now, 
I guess the question is, is how big does this get in the next year? Do the, does this idea scale pretty quickly? So w- 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 one of the benefits of this platform is that the, the, uh, the thing that you're replicating, the restaurants, uh, are very easy to build. Right. So they don't require the same sort of infrastructure that a typical fast food or fast casual restaurant, or for that matter, any restaurant requires. We don't re- require gas service. Um, I have less than a 200 amp electrical service. Amazing. Which is that is small. so cool. We don't wow. require, we don't require um, exhaust hoods or fire suppression systems. And so basically with a light uh, veneer applied to the existing space, you, you bring in the, the physical platform and that is the design. That is the architecture, if you will. And, and that, that happens in just a, it's just a couple of weeks. I, I, I see I see the future here, Steve. And, and I, I go back to what you said earlier about how when you launched Chipotle in 1993, you did a lot of things that felt uncomfortable for diners. And I think when you walked in, and I'm glad to hear you have a greeter because I think you need human interaction, but seeing a robotic arm work, it's different. There's probably some snark out there. Some people are like, that's just a robotic arm restaurant, but you fully believe this is the future. I do. I think I think it's the future because it solves some some problems. We're using a lot less energy. Uh, we're able to uh, to cook better food, more complex food, more interesting food. Uh, we're able to um, to serve it to customers uh, more accurately, more consistently, hotter, and um, and uh, we're able to to use smaller spaces. Yeah, and that's going to be the key with real estate issues. That's you know, right. Finding the right spots. And right. then and then I think most importantly to me were. We're offering uh, folks an opportunity, uh, a job that is that is that's really meaningful. Yeah, it's with, more with interesting. Meaningful compensation, and and they get to be you know part of. They get to have part of the action. How did you and Andrew Black connect? I know he's friends with my my co-author Dookie uh, back from JG days, but I, I think that Andrew is such a talent. And let's go over a few of the menu items uh, at Colonel right now, but just, just give our listeners a sense of what you're what you're cooking. Yeah, the, the menus. Pretty straightforward, and it's it's the kind of food that that I think people want to eat every day. So lots of vegetables, and um, we have uh, vegetable side dishes that are uh, composed, if you will, and they have four components. They have the vegetable itself, uh, plus a grain or a legume, plus a sauce, plus a crunch. So for instance, the way carrots work, uh, it's roasted carrots. And um, and dates, and uh, then it has a, a salsa verde, and the the crunch is um, spice toasted almonds, and the grain is uh, farro. Mm. So it really is. It's a very sort of like a balanced side dish, right? And so uh, again, the combination of grains, legumes, vegetable sauce, crunch uh, really elevates. Uh, the typical vegetable experience. What about Andrew? How does he play in this in this world? So Andrew is is uh, was my second uh, employee, or I should say, he was my first employee. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> so, the you're the first, right? And um, <laughs> and uh, Andrew was my personal chef and had been for uh, a few years and is extraordinarily talented. I mean, such a well rounded uh, chef, an amazing palate, really organized, and just a very disciplined thinker in the kitchen. And so when I started working on this idea, I was asking him for help making some different um, uh, vegetable plant-based patties for sandwiches. Uh, We experimented with all different kinds of fermentation and mycelium and and things like this. And and so um, uh, after some time, he kept, you know, overhearing my discussions with others about what I thought this concept could become, and he and he asked to join. He said, "I want to, I want to be the chef." I love it. So this is your personal chef, uh, which your busy schedule. You need a guy making your food, but like you become like collaborators. Did Andrew know this was going to be the future when he signed on to cook for you professionally? So uh, Andrew and I had great collaboration, you know, for the meals that that he would prepare, and, yeah. and it was really fun working. You guys were vibing on the foods, yeah, really, really in sync. And, uh, and Andrew had a lot of questions about my career and, and, and Chipotle's trajectory. And, and of course, I, I always add 
sort of sort of like, like you know, the core values that I believe in that that made Chipotle special and and that really resonated with him and so he wanted the opportunity I mean he sees that 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 Colonel has the potential to really change the way people think about and eat fast food in a profound way and uh, he wants to be part of that and and he is a very impactful part of it his food is is very very enlightened yeah I, I love I love that we were giving Andrew some flowers here because he deserves it and and I I, I just go back to that plant-based chicken the way that it crunches the way that it it, the flexibility in, in the saucing with it, I, it's, a, it's a real highlight for me. I'm very proud of the menu, um, but we're, we want to push the menu a little bit more and we want to have some more iconic flavors. And so we have three new sandwiches, which ah. I think are incredible. One is a, a Reuben sandwich. Oh, cool. So on our beautiful toasted bun, we have uh, sauerkraut, and Thousand Island dressing, and real melty Swiss cheese, and and for instead of corned beef, we have corned Yuba. So that's the the sort of the, the, the tofu skin, right? The, the Steve, I've said on the show, the veggie Reuben is like my favorite sandwich. But the bottom is number one. The veggie Reuben is number two. It's incredible. I, it I tastes, love the tastes, veggie it Reuben. It tastes just like it tastes just like a Reuben. Well, you don't need the corned beef. Like you don't need it. It's it's very good. I, yeah, I, I, and uh, I love it. I'm going. I'm so, checking it out. So that that will eventually make its way to the menu. Um, we have an iconic eggplant parm, and um, you know, and rather than do slices of of uh, eggplant that that are fried, we we uh, cube the eggplant, roast them, and then make a patty out of that with the mozzarella on the inside. Yeah. So so these three sandwiches had the addition of cheese. We were a vegan menu before, and now we're going a little bit more broad, still not having meat on the menu, but uh, adding uh, some some dairy. Does that come cheese. into like product market fit? Are you thinking about these things and adding dairy because plant-based can be challenging in New York? So I, I think, I, I, listen, plant-based, uh, I, I really respect those who adhere to a, a, a vegan diet uh, I think it's I think it's important and um, and but it's it's more difficult yeah. and especially so our core customer is not necessarily vegan or vegetarian they're meat eaters uh, but like a lot of people they're eating less meat and so we want to make sure that we have flavors and textures and aromas and um, and sort of like overall kind of eating satisfaction yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as much as possible so uh incorporating a little uh a little dairy and uh, some egg for um uh, real mayonnaise um helps with that we still have vegan items on the on the menu yeah you're always going to have that it sounds Absolutely. like steve you're you're very open about about making changes and and pivoting and yeah. and really uh admitting when maybe the initial idea and not being married to everything and not being the founder uh, who, who needs to have their way, That's right. so to speak. <laughs> so, and then the last sandwich uh, is is fascinating. Uh, this one, when I tasted it, really took me by surprise. Um, it's our Colonel Burger patty, which is sweet potatoes, uh, lentils, chickpeas, um, and some uh, vegetables and uh, herbs and things. And I think it's it's a delicious patty. It's not it's not meant to taste like beef but it has a very savory umami kind of Oh, I love flavor. it. It reminded me of Boca, which I think is, is not my favorite brand, but when you get it right in a restaurant setting, it's a little bit elevated. That's my that's my lane. Yeah, yeah. Veggie burgers should be veggie burgers, not fake meat in my opinion. So, but this this sandwich has that. Yeah. With uh with a piece of uh melted American cheese. Yeah. Special sauce. Okay. With finely chopped pickles. All right, my god, that's shredded. Really iceberg lettuce. What does it taste like? Oh, it's a shredded Big Mac. Yeah, <laughs> you said it, not me. Yeah, I know. But it tastes just <laughs> like it. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's incredible, but but of course better. I have to ask you, as a New Yorker who works in an office tower not not far from uh, the location of Curl on 24th and Park, uh, I eat a sweet green all the time. I love the company. I know Nick and, and the folks over there. What do you think about sweet green in terms of observing it when you're opening up in uh, in a similar lane with them? Do, are you a fan of sweet green? And do you have like your own guac greens? Do you feel like there's going to be like a, a menu item that transcends and becomes a proper noun in our lexicon? 
So first of all, I have a ton of respect for those guys. And, um, you know, they conceived of, of Sweet Green in, in DC when they were in, in school. Yeah. And uh, they, were, they were all Chipotle fans. And so I've known those guys for, for a sure. long time and big fans and, and supporters also. And I think what they've done to uh, sort of transform uh, the typical lunch to something that's really healthful and sustainable and you know, sort of multi-dimensional um, is extraordinary. And look at all the salad places that have yeah. that have followed suit. And um, it's just a matter of time before I think that continues to um, roll across the country. I think I think a lot of critics have said, well, in the middle of the country, it's going to be harder to sell that that kind of salad. And 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 maybe 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 harder today. But I think I think. It's a great way to eat, and I think as people um, uh, embrace uh, some uh, lighter uh, meals into their overall diet, uh, sweet green uh, can be great. But it doesn't have to be light either. Uh, they've got some very hearty uh, options. I think they're executing on a very, very high level, and and it and it makes me happy that they've adhered to the Chipotle ethos of sourcing really great yeah. ingredients. Yeah, I mean, I had to ask you because they clearly were inspired by many tenants of Chipotle having a chalkboard with farmers on it. You know, having an assembly line that feels like it's human, having customizable uh, uh, offerings that mix together. Uh, I mean, do you feel that they're a competitor, or do you just? I mean, you're championing them just now. Well, but. so a competitor. I don't know. I think any 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 restaurant that serves food could be a competitor. Agree. But there's so much room uh, for for restaurants. Look at the rate at which Chipotle continues to expand. There's a lot of room for really good food out there. Yeah, correct answer. Thank you for for saying that. I feel like uh, I wasn't trying to lead you into any negativity. I no, just no, I feel no. like you got. But it. I am I am I am a big fan of theirs, and and I think they've done a very nice job. Uh, pushing into the automation slash robotics uh, uh, area, and um, and I and I went out recently and visited their their Infinity Kitchen in, in April, Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah. Very it's cool place. Very Absolutely, impressive. I can't wait to. I've not visited, but I yeah. can't wait to do that. Last question before we get to our last section. I got to visit your test kitchen when Nate Appleman was running it, and my God, what a cookbook collection! It seems like Steve, you're you're a fan of cookbooks. I can imagine. I mean, we we're recording this here at Penguin Random House. We publish many cookbooks. Are you? Are, do you have a particular fondness of cookbooks? I love cookbooks. I, I loved cookbooks when I was a kid. Uh, my mom had cookbooks. I used to pour through them and, and try to duplicate the the recipes. Um, it's always it's always been a passion of mine, and I continue to collect cookbooks. I don't I don't necessarily cook out of them like I sure. used to. Uh, but certainly I am in, inspired by them. Well, we don't think of cookbooks here um, as publishers as, as it only being an object to cook from. We think there's much more to gain from it. And, and I'm sure when you're thinking about you know global foodways, when you're thinking about your menu items, cookbooks help you a little bit. On This Is Taste, we ask guests about their discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Are you ready? Don't go too fast. I won't go too fast. <laughs> the best fruit. Well, I would I would say blueberries because I have blueberries every morning, it, and and you know I try to stay seasonal, but I, I not with blueberries. You can hit Driscolls once I have in a while, year round and they're and they're pretty damn good year round. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a private chef now? Back like now that Andrew's working. I mean, I do. I make my own breakfast. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because your private chef is gone. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> the worst vegetable. There really isn't a worst vegetable. I don't think. I think I think some vegetables make for awkward wine pairings. Yeah. Uh, is people think asparagus is tough. Uh, artichokes can be tough. I love both of those vegetables, but not necessarily with great wine. So do you travel for wine? Is, is wine a big passion of yours? It is. It has been for a long time. Yeah. Have you written about wine? I have not. Steve, have you have you thought about writing a cookbook or a book about wine? People have asked me a, about writing anything. A book. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not much of a writer anymore. Yeah. And. Um, uh, it's not It's not where I would put my energy. Here's the thing about writing books. You don't have to necessarily write them. <laughs> People can help you. That's what I'm told. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll leave it there, but it'd be great to to read your work and hear about your wine travels. Okay. We asked this for all of our guests, so I'm going to ask you it as well. Your favorite American fast food chain? In-N-Out Burger. You said that unequivocally without a flinch. It's, I mean, to me, it is the iconic American fast food item, the... Yeah. The double-double. Double-double with an uh, animal. It's great. Yeah, it's so great. I love that you, and, and you know, West Coast, East Coast, we, we, can't, we can't get that out here. Yeah, that's right. 
Your favorite cookbook of all time? I, I guess it would be um, Lulu's Provencal Table. Um, yeah. And I've cooked so almost cool. everything out of that. I love it so much. Uh, I continue to eat. I mean, that ratatouille recipe, I, I make that when all my uh, my garden is giving off yeah. great zucchinis yes. and eggplants. C- come and September peppers. here. You got, early September, um, you got to be doing ratatouille. The, um, one of my favorites from the book is the um, Swiss chard gratin. It's amazing. Yeah. So simple, just a, a handful of ingredients, but... It's how you really, could eat a lot of really, vegetables, really gratin. Pure, really yeah. pure food. Uh, do you have a favorite Los Angeles restaurant right now? You know, I don't I don't go to Los Angeles enough yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to really know, to be honest with you. A favorite recent cookbook discovery? Well, from Los Angeles, um, Evan Funky's um, Americans Folino. Yeah. Uh, it's He focuses on uh, a few uh, iconic pasta shapes for fresh pasta um, from Bologna. And right. I think his his instruction is so uh, careful and specific. All, rolling out uh, fresh pasta to the right thickness is always tough. And it's tough to, because um, everybody's pasta maker, his numbers are, are, are different, yeah. it seems. But he talks about how many um, post-it notes uh, <laughs> you stack up uh, to have the right kind of thickness. What uh, a great metric. Oh, it's it's really terrific. This so is I, smart. I, I like that book. I don't know if it's so new. Maybe just maybe it's a few years old, but it's relatively new. Have you been to any of his restaurants? I have. Yeah, yeah. I was in uh, in, L- in L.A. and went to... Um, uh, Felix Funky, uh, Mother Wolf. Mother Wolf. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. I haven't met him personally, but uh, I'm a fan. Favorite city outside America to visit for food? <sighs> well, I mean, I love Tokyo. Uh, it's... It's so difficult. It's so complicated. It's so vast and so precise. Uh, I love yeah. it. But, but mu- much more accessible and, and, and I visit more frequently is San Sebastian. Um, I think what, a, what an amazing food culture and so much more focused, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, sort of the, the offerings from the sea and also... Just the natural beauty. I, I mean, mean it's, it's pretty amazing. Do you bike up there too? Do you do some biking? I haven't really biked a lot in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 Chipotle sponsored a Tour de France team called Garmin Chipotle for about three years. And I used to ride with the, the, the team. Um, so cool. Who are, who are some of the riders, some of your well, team members? Well, it was members. Jonathan Vodder's team. Okay. Right? But, I, but we used to ride with like the... The team doctor and the, some of the trainers and some oh. of the mechanics and, and before the races and and those were grueling rides. Those were really fun. So that was that's the extent of my European. Wow, riding. that must have been so great to to be on the tour and like going to all those cool French towns. That's like my dream is just to do that one year. So there was a a, a big uh, Tour de France break in Pau and um, and we used to make. Uh, the team dinner, so we made burritos <laughs> for them, and uh, of course they wanted mostly white rice and and uh, chicken because they're in these massive calorie diets oh. with with uh, lots of carbs. What an amazing journey to be on tour with your your team with the name of your company. That was your, fun. Must have been cool. Good times. Um, a cuisine you would like to learn more about? Andrew, um, again, one of the most accomplished and and sensitive chefs that I know. Um, his repertoire was so broad. Um, he's um, his wife is Korean, and he makes he makes Korean like a Korean grandmother. Um, he's traveled through uh, Vietnam, and his 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 Vietnamese food is is extraordinary. He's taken uh, uh, cooking classes uh, in Bangkok, and his Thai food is so authentic and and the the extraordinary level of uh sort of like the meticulous prep it takes to to make ex- great thai food just blows me away and and so you know every time he 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 would cook i would i would learn but th- this is a this is something that that not every chef has the ability to go into into cuisines that are so different but to pick up on the nuances that allow you to have the, yeah. the you know, that, that real authenticity. Is yeah. You re- it's not like you're getting an education by just having him around. I, oh, I sure am. God, this is the Andrew Black. This is like the, I got to get Andrew in the, in the show. I'm going to, I'm going to do are, that We soon. are really lucky to have him. Yeah. On he's the team. good. He's a good, good, good guy. Last one, your favorite sandwich. 
what I, there are a lot of sandwiches that I like. I'm, yeah. I love tomatoes on sandwiches when when the tomatoes are, you know, in, in August, yeah. when you pull them off the vine and they're warm from the sun. And so just just like on a on an herby focaccia with some some mozzarella and like a little sprinkling of flaky sea salt. To me, that's a that's a great sandwich. Nothing's better. I love that. Last one to your what's your Chipotle order? What are you doing these days? So, you know, I ended up getting a every time I went to a Chipotle and I and I ate Chipotle multiple times a day for you know 27 years. Lucky guy. So, Not 27 bad. Years. And I would get a couple of bowls and I would just put a little bit of every single ingredient in the bowl next to each other and I would taste everything. And uh, it was just an exercise to make sure that, that we were <laughs> we were making everything yeah, the right yeah. way. So it's always a it's always a miss. So that's kind of your, your your typical is like literally the menu. Steve gets. But the if menu. I but if I were to go get a uh, something today, it would be a, a bowl with chicken and brown rice and black beans and hot salsa, cheese. Lovely, Steve Ells. What a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you so much for joining. This is Taste. Matt, thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumber. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening.